Fernando Marchesano, <laughs> who's going to talk about the Tabas in a Fury. Got? Got. Okay, so hi to everyone, and I also want to join the uh, the um, in thanking the organizers for this nice invitation, and not only for this conference, but also for the past uh, month workshop that uh, I think is quite nice, and we were all quite enjoying here in the Isaac Newton Institute. So, <coughs> um, so the topic I will be talking about today for the next 30, 35 minutes is about the same context you've been hearing about today and also yesterday, which is um, F-theory, but is more or less a more detailed computation on how the Yukawa couplings look like in these local cut models I've been all been hearing about in several talks. Uh, this work has been going on for some time. There was uh, this paper with Luis Aparicio, Ana Maria Fontan, Luis Ibanez last year, and this has been uh, all that I will also comment at the end on some update that we are doing with my student Diego de Rolado. So, so the basic idea can be summarized in this picture that I stole from uh, Kunru et al. in one of their earliest papers, is that you have this class of models where if you want to compute certain things, you can basically zoom in and rephrase all your problems that you have in your grand unified theory, or even if you want to do some other theory, you could also, some other gate theory, you could also do it here in this four cycle, okay? So basically all the uh, ingredients or the guess stars of our uh, four-dimensional gate theory model is translated in these uh, small pieces here in this picture and have to do with the geometry of this internal four cycle of your manifold. And of course there are, well, these matter curves that localize the chiral fields that you already heard, but what we are going to look at is basically when this uh, three of these three curves uh, intersect, they meet at the point that Yukawa coupling interaction is generated in four dimensions. Okay? Uh, so, so, well, this picture has led to a lot of work, and in particular, you already heard from the summary talk of Kunrum yesterday that we can do a lot of things, and this has been claimed to be possible to get, and so on. And the thing that I will be focusing on on whether one can get released to Yukawa, and if yes, how people can get it. Um, so to make it short, as I already briefly say, the Yukawa couplings arise when you have three of these um, internal curves of your four-dimensional um, cycle where the grand unified theory is localized. When you have the chiral matter fields localized in these curves and they intersect at a point, you generate a Yukawa coupling, which if you are in this uh, SU5 model, let's say, uh, will look like this, will be the SU5 typical Yukawa couplings, and once that you uh, add this uh, gut-breaking mechanism, which is adding the hypercharge flux, they will become the MSSM uh, typical Yukawa couplings. Um, the important thing here to remind is that the only thing that can make these guys and these guys different is the presence of this gut-breaking uh, element, which is the hypercharge flux, or in particular, its density at that particular point. Okay. So, <coughs> um, how one goes uh, and computes this Yukawa couplings? Again, I, I don't need to know the whole information of my compactification, fourfold, or whatever that is. I can zoom in into the, the four cycles, and for Yukawa couplings in practice, I can also zoom next to the point where this coupling is generated. But all the information should be uh, decoded from here, where this S is a four cycle, and this trace is taking over a higher um, gauge group, which is not the SU5, but this uh, uh, higher rank group, which is even SU12, E6, E7, E8. Okay? In practice, one just compute the uh, wave function for the fluctuations. They one plugs in this trilinear <coughs> coupling, and one gets a triple overlap of wave functions just like we are using Neutrotic back from the old days, but now with the uh, extra feature that these guys are heavily peaked around this point, and so we don't need to care about more than what is going on here, or if it's something more not, it should be very, very, very suppressed. <coughs> and, um, well, the, the, uh, the story becomes more interesting when one actually goes and starts computing things. One can basically take the uh, superpotential that's related to the previous expression that I told you, the D term, uh, derive from then the um, PPS equation of motion, then do it for the background and for the fluctuations, and one sees that just like in um, 
in Calabi 034 compactifications in diatrotic, the zero modes, the guys that are going to be your quarks, leptons, and so on, satisfy a Dirac-like equation that can be solved. And for the particular case where, your, where volume flux is constant, you get something like that. Basically, something that decays exponentially away from the matter curve and some holomorphic dependence along the matter curve, or at least in some particular gates, which is very useful for computation. Um, of course, well, here this, this is very simple, but this coefficient here depends on the slope of the intersection, of course. It's more peaked as soon as the slope is more um, localized, and it also depends on the density of flux around it. Good. <coughs> so the idea is that because of this um, exponential dependence, you can, define, you can divide your triple overlap in two pieces. One of them is a prefactor that is totally invariant under this U1 symmetry rotation. And the other one is this holomorphic uh, dependence that is not invariant in general. And so, as a result, when you go and compute the Yukawa couplings, you can think of many holomorphic functions, but uh, in general, only the ones that are constant are going to contribute to the Yukawa couplings. And this is where the, uh, the fact that only, in practice, only uh, one uh, particle gets a mass, or one family gets a mass, um, comes from. So you get a rank one. Yukawa matrix, at least in this particular simple computation I was telling you about, <coughs> that tells you that only one family will be massive. Um, in addition, one can go and compute this, all these prefactors, even be beyond this quick uh, reasoning to say that only you have rank one, and see that the actual Yukawa coupling is independent of this piece lambda that was depending on the slope. Uh, and and it, was independent of, it was depending on the flux. So it's also the uh, Yukawa coupling that you can compute uh, turns out to be independent of the flux, OK? And the important thing is that one can follow the arguments and computation of these people here to show that this is not only true for this toy model that I was telling you about with constant global uh, fluxes or constant slopes and so on, but it's more general. And even if you deform, if you have a slight deformation or even a big deformation, you will get the same result. You have round one Yukawa. Um, uh, at this level, okay. Um, so what do we do? So in order to in order to go beyond this rank one, which uh, looks very nice, in order to create hierarchies, but we want to really to go a little bit away from it to 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 have a hierarchy, hierarchical um, rank three Yukawa matrix. One can um, one way to go is to consider non-perturbative effects. <coughs> the same number two perturbative effects that you also heard um, in this conference, but um, perhaps a slightly different in the sense that they don't involve these charge zero modes that, that, that you've heard about, for instance, in Miriam's talk. So the idea of using non perturbative effects <coughs> is to uh, start from the observation that if I have a, let's say, type to be compactification and I have a, either a D membrane with a Gagino condensate or a Euclidean uh, D3 brain wrapping a rigid cycle. I will generate a superpotential for D3 brains uh, walking around my internal manifold. Okay, so this Gagino condensate um, creates a superpotential, creates a force for this D3 brain, which is a spacetime filling, but it, for the D3 brain after the Gagino condensate is not the same if it's here or there. Okay? Uh, and the idea, the simple observation, is that if instead of a D3 brain, um, I will have a magnetized membrane, the same thing should happen, OK? So because I have a Gagino condensate, if I place a magnetized seven brain here, the life of some magnetized seven brains should change. So how to make this more precise? Well, one can basically uh, rely on, on, on similar computations, uh, as done by Bowman et al., and realize that <coughs> when I have a this D3 brain, I have a back reaction coming from this D3 brain. Basically, this D3 brain is warping my geometry. This affects the gauge kinetic function of the seven brain. And one can understand this uh, as a one loop corrections that modifies the gauge kinetic function of this D7 brain when Gagino condensate is going to happen. Or the same will happen if I have an instant turning here. Okay? So in practice, instead of having that the gauge kinetic function of this D7 brain is the volume, the complexified volume, I have a dependence on the D3 brain position fields. <coughs> and the same will be true. Uh, if I have a magnetized D7 brain, because magnetized D7 brain has a D3 brain charge, has a back reaction on the warping, and so on and so forth. 
So, <coughs> in fact, this kind of things is not so different for, from what we were hearing from Thomas uh, a few minutes ago, because, well, here I have a magnetized system of brains. It will be a G-flex, and G-flex has back reaction. Back reaction changes the gauge kinetic function of seven brains, blah, 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 okay? Uh, and, but the idea is that with this reasoning here, what we are interested, though, is to, <coughs> to, to understand how the gauge kinetic function depends on the position moduli of this guy, either D3 brain or D7 brain. Because at the end, what we want to do is to exert a super potential on this person here. And the, uh, well, the rough idea goes like this. Um, D7 brain uh, is uh, like a diluted D3 brain when it's magnetized. This is the density of, uh, of uh, D3 brain charge that we have in a D7 brain. And so the, um, this, uh, the correction to the gauge kinetic function should go like this, which is a kind of a horrible expression compared to the D3 brain case. But then you can do Taylor expansion and uh, get a superpotential. <coughs> so if you want to uh, make it short how it looks like, this will be the superpotential for the ex um, that you get on your magnetized D7 brain, which I'm going to identify to the GAD theory and so on later on. And I will get my three levels of potential for the GAD theory plus this term here. Which again, in order to make things a little bit uh, manageable, I'm going to Taylor expand and get w uh, and only keep the lower terms in the expansion. So I just uh, Taylor expand on the uh, transverse position to the D7 brain, and every time I have a derivative, I just replace it by this phi or phi square or some power. So at the end, I get something like this, where uh, this term is a constant. This is basically um, the pullback of the um, on some holomorphic function, which is a divisor function of the fourth cycle. And uh, okay, maybe I didn't say that, but I am assuming here in this picture that these two guys are not touching, and so and this h here is the um, <coughs> is the defining function for this uh, divisor. So it's a holomorphic function that vanishes here, and so here it has to be constant because it's basically the pullback is a is a trivial section of a trivial bundle. It's a section of a trivial bundle. Anyway, so after all this um, reasoning, you get an, some extra piece for the superpotential that goes like this. And the, the, what, what, what the theory is basically tell you, just add up all your superpotentials and see what change. No? So um, the end result uh, at this point is I have the three level superpotential that I rewrite in this way. That was a previous um, turns out I don't like superpotential where all my initial computation started from plus this non-perturbative correction that has this, this shape. Okay. Uh, interestingly, uh, one can do and relate um, this, this expression to another one, which is basically taking, again, this initial superpotential and doing a non-commutative deformation, when basically what we need to do is to consider a cyber witten map. And after one trace these variables a and phi that are basically the data, geometric data of my seven brain by this non-commutative or this change of variables um, version, one goes from this expression to this expression. Okay? So basically, one can either do computations here or here to get what, what one wants. <coughs> and uh, although there's a little bit of an aside, it turns important because usually Doing computations here is, is much easier for some things, and then you can get you can get an idea of what's going to happen at the end, and you can give talks about it uh, without horrible expressions. So, uh, um <coughs> so the interpretation of this, let's say, duality or mapping between the commutative, the form commutative, and the form non-commutative, uh, um <coughs> and seven brain superpotentials, is that basically. Uh, what we are doing here is we are having a theory, a seven brain, typical, classical, and so on, and then an instant time comes and the life of the seven brain changes. And instead of uh, generating um, non perturbative superpotential instead of, uh, by means of an instant time, by means of non perturbative effects, w there is uh, these proposals in which you can basically trade this non perturbative effects by a new background that more or less encodes all the effects that you are exerting on other D brains. So instead of having this picture where I have a, this base threefold and a non perturbative effect here and the gut brain here, I basically change my background. And I, now I have a new kind of background, which is not a 
uh, is not one of these uh, ISD freeform fluxes in work Calabillao, but it's a bit of the information of the, of the former. Or if you want in F theory, it would mean I'm not playing with the Calabillao fourfold anymore. And, <coughs> and I don't have 2, 2 fluxes, I have some other kind of fluxes. So if for instance, in here, um, um, if I here I have the usual, um, let's say, 1, 2 and 3, 0 fluxes, even if I want to make supersymmetry, here, when I introduce this non-perturbative effect, since I am accessing a, a force on the D3 brains, I have something else. I have uh, this 1, 2 background fluxes, but because I'm changing the geometry, everything can be made supersymmetric as well. So this is usually called as the beta deformation of a Calavilla, and it has been shown in several examples how to do it, either well in the ADS5, process 5 conifo and so on. And the observation of these people is that in this new background, this beta deformed background, the D brains feel an uncommutative deformation. Okay, so the interpretation why we can go from one to the other, why it makes sense at all, why is it working, is because I can trade instantons by beta deformation, and beta deformation plus D brains is non-commutative deformation. Okay. So <coughs> after I did that, after I changed my superpotential, I need to do the computations again. That was the previous computations, just to briefly remind you. It can be summarized in this, uh, in this few uh, expressions. But now I have to do something else. Now this is going to change. This is going to change, and I get new F terms, even for the background and for the fluctuations, and I get a new kind of uh, wave function that can be expressed as, uh, well, the previous zero mode, but, but plus a sum of previous um, <coughs> uh, massive modes, OK? So that's it. Now the rules of the game is I plug these guys again into the, um, into the uh, Yukawa coupling expression and see what I get. And so that you get an idea, uh, in, a, in a toy model, before going to any grand unified theory, if I just take three D7 brains and I, and I put them at angles in order to break the gauge group. And I add this um, non-perturbative effect that will be codified by this holomorphic function. This is the theta that does the job on, on, on uh, making the uh, Yukawa rank higher. I will get something like this. So the usual rank one uh, contribution at three level, and then this epsilon suppress um, rank three contribution. Now, uh, an important thing. Um, to realize is that this expression still does not depend on the seven brain or volume fluxes. And this is actually very easy to see from the non-commutative point of view. And, um, and that's important because, as I told you at the beginning, the world volume fluxes are the only way you know, to break uh, the grand unified structure. So if something do does not depend on the, uh, uh, on the world volume fluxes, it will not depend on the hypercharged uh, fluxes. And you could not distinguish, and you should basically satisfy all the relations of the grand unified theory. Of course, this is only the holomorphic Yukawas. You can then, you should then compute the physical Yukawas where the normalizations take place. And the roughly idea is that in my physical Yukawas, this part will satisfy the grand unified relations, but this part will not because the wave functions have different normalizations because they have different hypercharge. And although Trying to satisfy this relation at the gut scale will be impossible uh, if, 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 if nothing dependent on the, the hypercharge flux. Um, <coughs> this three will be basically one. When we include this dependence on the hypercharge, one can basically pick parameters that satisfy this nicely. Okay? Um, good. So, what about now? Uh, so, so the, the, the rules of the game was I just have this, sup uh, this super potential give me rank one, I change it, it's no longer rank one. But then the, the factor or the additive thing that I, <laughs> that I put in, in the story was basically this term, which is a symmetric trace of three generators of a gauge group. And this is basically zero for all these groups, which are the interesting ones for F, for F theory cuts, okay? Which would mean that if I just go and apply whatever I was telling you before into the SO12 or E6 or E7 or E8, I will get basically that the uh, non perturbative correction is zero. Okay, so, so, so the question is why I am giving this talk uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I am going over my personal record about talking something that is 
zero, okay, from the very beginning. Well, the idea is um, is that uh, you have to revisit uh, the way you you get to the superpotential, and you have to go over the whole. Um, wh when you when you are dealing with these groups, you have a little bit to to reproduce all the all the uh, all the idea, and look at them uh, again at this term, which is an, the abstract number two of the superpotential, and go over the expansion again. So what we are just saying is that this log of h, we are doing this non-abelian Taylor expansion, which we can parameterize in this way. And basically, I am plugging each of these terms here. This term, what we are saying, is 0, but not this one. Okay? And this is also non-zero, but we just took it to be constant, so this topological it doesn't contribute. <coughs> so if we do this, if we basically pick this term, we get this new expression for the non-perturbative superpotential. And the rules of the games is now I do with this guy what I did with the previous one and see what I get. Uh, so again, so that's a new superpotential. And uh, well, let me be sketchy here because this is part of the new paper. Basically, what we get if we just add these two guys is that um, this is a new structure for uh, for Yukawa couplings that we get. This is not rank three at um, at the um, at first order in epsilon; it's only rank two. But of course, it won't go to higher orders in epsilon, where we'll get the rank three structure, uh, and which uh, resembles part of the expansion that I went got in these papers of Yukawa by Conrad et al. But uh, that's not all. Um, we are basically extremely lazy to go to the next order in epsilon, and and we were thinking if this is really the case that uh, that's all you can get in, for instance, SO12 uh, uh, grand unified. Uh, local f theory model. So in order to think a little bit more about it, let me just uh, rethink this, um, this assumption that the first term of this expansion, non-abelian Taylor expansion, basically the pullback of the divisor function of my Gutford cycle is constant. So for this, it's very useful to go to the uh, type 2p limit, which is something that you can nicely do in this SO12 Yukawa coupling because basically you have seven brains and oriented full planes when you go to type 2p and and think what what is going on so the idea here is that this well this uh, four cycles with uh, matter curves intersecting um <coughs> will be summarized in this picture where i have like five uh, these seven brains here the mirror or, or the uh, oriented full images of them and then the oriented full plane going on in the middle and of course, from this intersection, the anti-symmetric of SU5, namely the 10, will arise. So the matter curve here lives in on top of the oriented full plane. And then I want to include an unperturbative effect. So what I do is to have a D3 brain, Euclidean D3 brain instanton um, intersecting some oriented full plane, which could well be this one. Okay, could be many, could be if you have more, there could be another one, but it could well be this one. And I'm doing this because I need to require the uh, right structure of zero modes on my instanton to contribute to a superpotential. So it's not really a choice what the uh, D3 instanton does. It has to intersect an oriented fold. And the lesson here is that in this Yukawa points, uh, like SO12, or even in, um, in, uh, in another one, E6 or so, there will be some kind of oriented fold hidden. If you want, in SO12 is more like the comparison. That, that the uh, D3 brain instanton could intersect in order to have the right number of zero modes. Um, <coughs> and one could well have this picture. Actually, in this SO12 model, the picture that arises when you interpret things from the point of view of uh, perturbative type 2b is that you have a Yukawa points here. You have the uh, matter curves on top of the oriented fold that all happen here. And then the, oriented, the uh, Euclidean D3 brain instanton intersect another matter curve far away from them because basically you don't want any extra zero modes that spoil you, your, your setup. Uh, what is the, the interpretation in F-theory? Uh, OK, this is less, less, um, <coughs> less uh, um, how do I say, precise, but nevertheless, you can a little bit get the flavor. If I have a. Um, F-theory GUT model, and if I want to include non-perturbative effects coming from D3 brains or Euclidean uh, uh, E3 uh, instantons, I need to, uh, these guys need to have the right structure of zero mode. 
This means that they have to intersect some seven brain in some place, which when I go to type 2b will be identified most likely with the orientifold seven plane. Okay. Um, so it could we have basically two possible like, scenarios. One is this guy intersects one of the seven brains that are involved in my GAT model, not maybe the SU5 GAT seven brain, but one of the guys that create the matter curves and go away, this extra U1 seven brains. Or it does intersect some seven brain far away that has nothing to do with this picture. They are totally uh, separated physically. Okay? So the previous uh, scenario where I don't get rank three at the uh, first order in epsilon is this one, and the second one is this one in which this term that I care now so much about is non-constant because then it's not anymore true that this is a, is a trivial bundle and this guy doesn't need to be constant. So, <coughs> but the rough idea is you can think of two scenarios where these non-perturbative effects can arise and this will give you two different kinds of physics, okay? So in the second scenario, I have this new extra term and when I add it, uh, oh, okay, I'm plenty of time. It's when I add it, um, I get a new structure of Yukawa matrices in which I have these new entries here and I can get rank three at the, um, at the first order in epsilon, which, which will give you bigger Yukawas if you want, okay? Um, good. Um, this is, sorry, this is the holomorphic part only. You can see also that it's independent of the word volume fluxes, so the same uh, ideas apply. At this level, the, the Yukawa couplings for, let's say, uh, leptons and down quarks are exactly the same because the only way this, these guys can feel that they don't live in a grand unified theory is via the hyperturf flags that is not anywhere in this place. Uh, the, the, the things the Yukawas depend on are on this constant that has to do with uh, some holomorphic function that depends on the geometry of the internal manifold and where your instanton or, or uh, Gagino condensate is, is localized. And then uh, when you include the whole story, you get a more complicated physical uh, um, matrix of Yukawa coupling in which, well, you also have the normalization and some mixing angles between uh, in your families, your previous families, okay? And so is it in here in which all the hypercharge dependence, all, the, uh, all what is, has to do with breaking the grand unified theory down to the MSSN should be felt and if the mass relations that differ from, um, from, um, from the grand unified theory of mass relations should appear, okay? Uh, this, we haven't checked it yet, but that's, that's what we're basically doing. And I'm basically done. So the, uh, the conclusions are very straightforward. We are just trying to do this computation and see what we get. <coughs> the good news is that we can do a very precise uh, computation which we I identify uh, by means of the number to the effects, but if you want to be more practical, we just produce a superpotentials which are not the three level ones, and we reanalyze all the um, computation of wave functions with these new people. Um, one can do analytical these computations, <coughs> and, um, and well, the bottom line is that with uh, reasonable assumptions, one with this rank three flux independent holomorphic Yukawas plus the non-holomorphic flux dependence uh, contribution that should basically, if we want to make this realistic, um, explain all the mass ratios that, that we see in the MSSM that we would expect from the MSSM and not going in five years. So, thank you. Questions? Yo. So what sets the value of epsilon? It's basically the instanton volume, if you want. Is it, is it, is it, is it strength? Well, it depends where you see. Um, okay, so you have a modification to this potential. It depends where it comes from. You could see different scenarios. If you're in the, in, in the non perturbative thing, it will be the uh, instanton volume, if you want. That would be the thing. If you, if you want to back react and think of uh, some other kind of fluxes, that will be the density of flux. Yeah. Have you uh, also studied the context of key brains, the monodromic case? No. We uh, we uh, we tried to look uh, <coughs> to think about it, but uh, 
we decided to leave it for uh, for for later. But we are looking for um, um, <laughs> volunteers <laughs> here in the audience. Uh, please approach us for on the lunch break. <laughs> In your relationship between the, the holomorphic and the physical Yukawas, you needed the, the great potential for the minor fields. Uh, Georgi Oscar. Oh, sorry, the, the, the great potential what? The great potential of the minor fields. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, it was, it's just the typical expression of supergravity. I didn't. Well, I guess, well, there is a key to the K over 2, I guess, on top of that. Yeah, well. But, but also, uh, uh, which which values of k's are you you just because that, that, that's a model that can I, I actually here what I meant here if you want this borrowed uh, is just having uh, wave functions which are canonically normalized so I have canonical kinetic terms and dividing by the normalization so I am not even seeing this in the in the full supergravity con I'm just having a canonical kinetic term <coughs> but maybe I didn't answer your question what was the second part we can talk there, yes. oh, okay okay the, the mass relations are not as stronger than what you've written there because they're actually. This is one of them. This is one of them. I just gave that Because if you see here, um, I, I only have good control over the uh, of heaviest, uh, heaviest uh, families of uh, quarks and leptons, so I wouldn't dare to say anything about the lightest one because they go. No, but I'm talking about the heaviest. In the sense that, my, my, oh. my only point is that if the hypercharge flux distorts the relation between the arc. Uh, the muon and the strange, you should also distort the relation between the tau and the bottom. But that, those unify very precisely. Um, well, but actually, but not so much. OK, yeah, so, so you say you want to keep this relation, but so you, you, you don't want to have a 1 here, but you want to have a, the quotient equal to 1 here. Is that what you're saying? Or no, not? just between the top. The, I'm saying that the tau yeah. bottom unification is very exact <coughs> in yeah, no, 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 I know, I know. But <laughs> why does the hypercharge flux ruin that? If it, if it we just tried with a few values and it was working fine for these two people. So, I mean, for the ratio between these two, you are not talking about here, I guess. So, we would, we would, we would try, and that could be, both could be accommodated. So, okay. but, I mean, I don't have further intuition, actually. You mean MB over M tau is slightly renormalized by a factor of 1.2 or something like that? Not but terribly. It, it, it's the other one by three. Why does it keep these? No, no, you don't get there? such big values. Be because the heavier, heavier, um, the heavier um, families, the distortion of the um, of the flux is less. Okay. Mm -hmm. not yes, so I, I want to understand that relation a little bit better. So, this one, this one. yeah, I mean, the m tau okay. equals m b and m mu equals m s is an SU five relation, right? And now you're saying that relation is somehow broken in the killer in the killer function uh, by what? But, but by this, I, I'm referring to this whole paper of Georgia Oscar. Well, Georgia Oscar was a different relation, but <laughs> it's not this one. No, it's sort of like M U over M E is equal to uh, nine times M S over M D. But uh, they were trying to change. This is the first step in their in their relation. Mm -hmm. But that's not the point. The question is, just look at. Usually you get m tau equals mb and you like that, right? And now you want to get mu equals 3ms, right? And the question is, how is the, the uh, breaking of SU5 enter into the Keller function? Here, in the normalization. So these guys are going to be the same for, uh, let's say, the, uh, if you are talking about leptons or they're, they're the same because there's an SU5 relation, right? Yeah. So the, how, the SU5 how is the SU5 relation broken in the Keller potential? Because isn't it also have the SU5 symmetry there? No, no, no. no because because we, we've been hearing about flexes distorting uh, non-holomorphic quantities all, all along, and that's what is going on here. So these non-protective flux, non-protective quantities, which are the normalization of we find the hypercharge flux. Exactly, they are. They depend on the hypercharge flux. Mm -hmm. And so what is true before introducing the hypercharge flux is not true after so why should these people. So why should it distinguish? The second family from the first, the third family? Because the uh, the families are differently picked. In, in the way you choose it to have uh, eigen, eigenvalues of this initial matrix here, mm -hmm. the uh, families are differently picked. The the um, the width of the of the wave function is not the same. Okay, and so they, the ones that are more spread, they feel more the flux. That's my basic understanding. But if someone else has another one, I I beg that you. <laughs> Okay. 
But the basis which is natural to the holomorphic Yukawa coupling is just vanishing, order of vanishing at the intersection point of the curves. Mm -hmm. And that's not the same basis in which the wave function has a particular norm. Mm -hmm. And that is affected by the mm -hmm. that is affected by what is the flux. Yeah. So I mean the George Oscar relation is, you know, the, the point is that they like the relation M T M tau is equal to M B. That that's fine. Mm -hmm. But then they wanted to change the relationship between M U equals M S and M D equals M E because then you would get M U over M E equals M D over M uh, M S over M D which doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. And so they added a factor of three and one and another factor okay, of one well, third okay. in the other. Okay, this, okay, good. So this is not the whole story, of course, but I'm just focusing on here again for what I told you. Right. And I cannot, I cannot say anything at this point right. about this lighter uh, fermion. So, so I'm just, if you want to get in half of the story, if yeah. in, in, in practice, once you get the whole thing, once, once know what's going on for the whole metric. More questions? <coughs> Now that we thank Fernando again. <laughs>